There's so many questions right now remaining about the attacks on France last week. Joining us from Washington is Congressman Adam Schiff, and there is Adam Schiff, the ranking member of the House Select Committee on Intelligence. Uh, good to have you with us, Congressman. Listen, these Thank are you. these are perilous times. We know what happened in Paris. There's uh, a threat out against Washington D.C. now from ISIS. This is not unusual. There are a lot of threats against us from ISIS. Is this one more important? Well, I wouldn't say it's more important, but we're certainly concerned in the wake of Paris that there may be copycat type of attacks here. We're a much harder target to reach for ISIS, uh, and we have far fewer people that have left the United States to join the, the jihad in Iraq and Syria and come home. So we have a smaller uh, threat uh, to watch than Europe does. But nonetheless, if these events inspire homegrown radicals to attack, uh, that's uh, what's keeping us awake right now. In the longer term, however, if Syria and Iraq still continue to be a safe haven for ISIS, uh, then we have to guard against these more massive attacks like we saw in Paris. One of the concerns is that in Paris, prior to the attacks, there wasn't much chatter that was detected. And so else here in the United States or even all over the world could be going in the dark. And that comes into play when we talk about encryption technology, using gaming systems like PlayStation in order to communicate. How worried should we, about, will we be about that and what can we do? Well, there is an increasing problem, as you say, of going dark, uh, and that is ISIS is instructing its people, uh, once it, for example, recruits people openly on social media, to go to these dark forms of uh, communication, these encrypted text messaging applications, uh, and that really prevents uh, law enforcement and the intelligence community from being able to uh, learn what they're doing, what they're planning, and when. We have yet to determine what role encryption played in the attacks in Paris. But we know operationally ISIS has been instructing their operatives to move to these secure lines of uh, communication. So this is a big challenge already. It's going to be an even bigger challenge in the future as these encrypted applications become more and more prevalent. This is something I know you addressed um, recently, but it's just so unsettling that it seems as though ISIS has adapted to our defenses and even the best intelligence can't combat that. So what do we do? Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, even the best of intelligence uh, against an adversary that holds ground, that has the time, the space to plan and to plot, that has the resources to do it, uh, you can't be successful in defending against every attack all the time. That's the challenge. Ultimately, it means we're going to have to eliminate that space uh, from their uh, capacity to hold in Iraq and Syria. We're going to have to do something to change the dynamic. I think these aerial sorties and a small number of special operators won't change that dynamic. Uh, I think we are going to have to exp explore the creation of safe zones uh, within Syria from which we can train and equip opposition forces, these moderate forces, from which we can help uh, some of the refugees stem that refugee flow into Europe, but something is going to have to be undertaken to really change that dynamic, deny that safe sanctuary from which ISIS All right, Congressman Schiff, kind of attacks. Congressman Schiff, I'm listening to you and I'm thinking two things as you're saying this. One is it seems like you're pushing back against the president. Uh, it seems like you want to be much more proactive than he does when it comes to those areas. And the second is you talk about those moderate uh, people in Syria. And we've always talked about the moderate people. And a lot of people ask the question, where are they? Who are they? How well, do you know? Yeah. 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 These are both good questions. Uh, in terms of the president's uh, strategy, I agree with the president. The answer here is not to have a massive occupation of Syria and Iraq. Uh, we have tried that. Uh, and unless we're prepared to stay there indefinitely, it doesn't solve the underlying problem. At the end of the day, there has to be a Sunni polity. Uh, in Syria, and there has to be Sunni participation in Iraq in their government, uh, or we're going to continue to have a safe space for ISIS. Uh, but I also agree uh, with some of the critics that we're going to have to do more than aerial sorties uh, and special operations forces. It's going to simply take too long under the present trajectory uh, to take back this territory from ISIS. Uh, and as long as they have that space, they can plot against us. In terms of the moderates, they're very hard to find as this civil war has dragged on in Syria. It has increasingly marginalized those that are more moderate. Uh, this is really something Bashar al-Assad has tried to do, which is go after the moderates and turn this into a fight uh, choice between he and the terrorists. There are, though, still some moderate forces that we can work with, are working with, 
And in fact, as you see, the Kurds in Syria, the Peshmerga Kurds in Iraq have been among the most effective and moderate fighting forces on the ground in either country. How do you feel about bringing in 10,000 Syrians as a humane gesture? Uh, I think we need to do our part to help on the refugee crisis, and I understand people's concern. Uh, but, you know, it's times like these that test the nation's character. Uh, and the character of our country has always been to extend uh, its heart, its generosity, and its safe space for those that are fleeing persecution, often religious minorities. Uh, and I think we need to rise to the challenge today. But what about... Uh, we need to make sure that... Yeah. What about our safe space? I understand the humanitarian side of this, but our number one concern in the United States is to keep the people here safe. So what do you say to those people who, who are extremely concerned... Oh, and, and who don't trust the vetting process at all? Because how... Yeah. What vetting what, process? What, what process do you propose that could be safe enough to vet these people who are coming to the U.S.? Well, you know, absolutely, the top priority is keeping our people safe, and we're going to have to make sure that we use uh, every uh, capability possible to vet those, to look into the backgrounds of those that we would accept as refugees. But, but if you look historically where we've had a problem, uh, it hasn't been among the refugees. Uh, when you look at the mass shootings in the United States, unfortunately, most of these people are born right here in America. Uh, and refugees tend to live very lawful lives uh, when we accept them into the United States. I don't so think there's anyone no question, is... There's no question there's some risk uh, in accepting refugees, but it's a risk America has always been willing to take, uh, and I think that's part of our national character, and I would hate to see us uh, at a time where we've seen the most massive refugee flow since World War II uh, turn our back on these people who are in need. I don't think anyone is saying the refugees are the ones that could cause harm. However, seeing what happened in Paris where one of these guys who blew himself up had had a fake passport, acted as a refugee, went through Greece, eventually ended up in France. The risk that they can disguise themselves and take advantage of the fact that we are welcoming refugees, even if one or two get into this country, that's a big risk to the average citizen. It, it's a great concern to me. Well, you know, it is a concern, uh, but again, if you look at uh, what happened in France, um, almost all and potentially all of those responsible were French citizens, uh, were Belgians, they were Europeans. Uh, we are looking into this passport that was found, a Syrian passport, to determine is this a Syrian, someone from Aleppo who came in. Uh, that is a risk, but no one is suggesting that we allow hundreds of thousands of people to come in unscreened, as indeed is what's happening with this refugee flow in Europe. That's not what we're proposing. But we do think that we ought to play a role in helping this humanitarian catastrophe by embarking on the most uh, rigorous of vetting possible. Uh, but, you know, I do have to acknowledge that there is some risk associated whenever you uh, allow anyone into the country. But frankly, the far greater risk we have faced is from the problem of mentally ill people in the United States with too ready access to firearms, as well as those who are homegrown radicals inspired by ISIS online propaganda. So I think we have to put the risks in perspective, uh, and I think we have to re remain true to our national character. Congressman Adam Schiff from the Rotunda at the Capitol in Washington. Thank you very much, Congressman. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay.